Hi, my name is Chris and welcome to Module 2 of Global Strategy and Leadership. In this module, we're looking at the external environment. What do we mean by that? Well, if we're going to do an analysis on a, an organisation in an industry, we've got to understand the broad macro impacts. Okay? What we mean by that is this industry sits in the environment on our planet. And so it's affected by a whole bunch of forces, both external remote forces and also more focused uh, close forces, right? And there's two key concepts that we're going to get to shortly about that. And just to bring it into context in terms of, you know, the types of companies that this has affected and, and how it's easy to use organisations and stories as examples to explain it. If we think about, let's say, Motorola, or you could say Nokia, the biggest uh, mobile phone manufacturers in the 80s and the 90s. I think Motorola was the first mobile manufacturer. Now, what didn't they see coming? Well, they didn't see the tech and they didn't see the social change, both forces here. And we're thinking about Pestle. The tech in the, in the terms of smartphones, being able to put your finger on a screen, swipe left, swipe right, that, that simple bit of Technology that was no doubt hard to, to produce in research and development, though, fundamentally changed how people wanted to use phones. So the tech and the social uh, had a relationship in those two forces, and Motorola, Motorola and Nokia just weren't on it. They just didn't see it coming. And by the time they reacted, in a sense, it was too late. People like Apple and Samsung and others had already uh, gone into the market. Uh, similar to... Polaroid cameras, right? What didn't they see coming? Well, they didn't see the digital camera. And many of you would know the classic story of Kodak, not understanding that digital technology and digital cameras and the need to not use film was going to take over the world. And they knew that because they had developed one of the first digital cameras, but their revenue came from uh, the, the Polaroid, right? So those, those square, Polaroid uh, film pictures that you use and also reels of film. Okay, they, They've been relying on that for many, many decades and they didn't want to lose that revenue, but they didn't believe that the broad economic environment factors could hurt them. Borders, so borders were a big book chain stall. So in some ways, borders disrupted the small uh, bookshop because that person really struggled to survive when you had a superstore. Right, so Borders was like the Walmart or the, the Bunnings of books. You could get any book on anything there. But they didn't believe that, again, social changes from an enabling of technology around things like Amazon, the Kindle reader, the ability to, to buy books online. Okay, so Amazon started not, not with the Kindle first, but it started with just buy a book a lot cheaper online, have it mailed out to you. And then there's Book Depository in, uh, in the UK, and so these particular online offerings changed the whole industry. And in the end, borders went bust. Okay. Similar, very similar to Blockbuster. Another famous story, Blockbuster versus Netflix. Why did, did Netflix have an impact? Partly because Blockbuster senior management refused to believe uh, that this idea of mailing, mailing out to get uh, from an online website to get a DVD sent to you, watching it and then returning it could build into anything, right? And Netflix started out like that. Before, before all this streaming and we just hit a button on our phone or our iPad and then cast it to our TV, before all that, it was simply a mail order service for DVDs, right? Blockbuster didn't believe it and they didn't want to, just like, uh, just like Kodak actually and the Polaroid manufacturers, didn't want to walk away from one of their key revenue streams. And I don't know if you would think what this might be. Have a guess. But late fees. Blockbuster relied on people returning uh, VHS videos and then DVDs late. And here's another one here, just to finish off. Slater and Gordon, okay, originally an Australian company uh, of lawyers. So they were a partnership, like many law firms, and then they actually listed themselves. They decided they wanted to be a limited liability company on the stock exchange. And they also wanted to go into new markets and they went to the UK. And the thing that they were known for is, um, they do call the term ambulance chasing, but standing up for small people who are taking on 
claims around workers' compensation or accident claims. They've been hit by a car um, and they've been hurt and they want to claim um, money back from that for lost earnings and things like that. But as they were entering the UK market, and they would have known this, the UK government was going through some fundamental changes in both policy and legislation. And these two changes were going to dramatically affect the business model of the company that Slater and Gordon wanted to acquire. They still went ahead with the acquisition. The changes came in from government and bang, they got whacked, completely whacked and their revenue slumped, their share price tumbled and they basically nearly went bankrupt. They still exist, they nearly went bankrupt in really the space of just a couple of years. So there's always great examples about organisations that didn't see changes in the external environment, in the industries that they operated in, which then fundamentally hurt them in terms of the ability to grow revenue and be profitable. If we have now a look briefly at a subject map of GSL, where we are is in this left part of the map, this first column. This is about the external analysis. You can see that we'll move to internal, we'll move towards product and market development and so on. But at the moment, we're focusing on the industry and a couple of key concepts there. These concepts will be covered, no doubt, in the final CPA exam, whether it's in the written component or the MCQs. But we need, we need to understand these concepts and how to apply them. Of course, we've got learning objectives for module two. All right, we're going to think about how you define an industry and what's a value chain. And you will have covered value chains because most of you will have already done uh, SMA. The industry life cycle, what is it? How many stages? What do they mean? Historical performance, growth and profitability, uh, but also future performance we need to know about, future growth. And that's things that are linking directly to these key concepts. All right, what's the success factor? How does that link? And it does very closely to the idea of a basis of competition, a little bit about customer segmentation, and then we finish up uh, with some stuff about IT. So in section one of module two, we're focusing on defining the industry and understanding the value chain. And we can ask ourselves now, is this actually a hard thing to do? Well, yes, it can be hard. Some of the reasons include the fact that you you can have different definitions. And if you define an industry one way, you can change the definition and make it perhaps more narrow or broader, but that will affect how you then do a pestle, how a fire forces analysis is done. So we need to be consistent here. If you're, you're doing this in real life, which you will be if you end up in a corporate strategy or a business strategy team, um, what data have you got available? Is that data reliable? Can you, can you get accurate data about an industry? As an example, uh, you are in cryptocurrency. How much reliable, accurate data do we have about all the different forces that can be affecting cryptocurrency? We have some, but we also know that they haven't even got around uh, to regulation and policies and guidelines around cryptocurrency from key accounting boards uh, around the world. So this is a moving feast and actually don't really have reliable data. Ambiguous signals that make data hard to interpret. What we mean by that, uh, again, changes. If we think about cryptocurrency again or blockchain, there's a lot of potential government legislation involved, but the governments aren't sure about how they're going to do uh, the legislation and the regulations. So there's, there's different signals occurring and many of these companies are, I guess, quite unsure of how this might affect their industry, even in the next three to six months, let alone what it looks like over the next five years. It's important to remember that the past doesn't necessarily predict the future. What's happened in the past in terms of historical growth and levels of profitability doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's going to be into the future. All right? And of course, there's some things you just can't control. For instance, the weather. So we're looking at this first learning objective now in module two. Defining an industry, it's a group of organizations, right? They're trying to do the same thing. They're in, engaged in selling products and services. The company has to think about what industry they sit in because they can define it different ways, okay? But what's important, as I said before, is that when you're doing analysis that you're consistent. So the, the idea of the Matreshka dolls there, uh, the fact that 
each one looks similar, but they're sub segments. But but you are being consistent in how that you define and then analyze your industry, and that's that's important to do because it's it's easy to um, go down the wrong path in terms of, of strategy analysis if you modify your definition halfway through, right? and that can be as simple as global industry, Australian industry. Different things are happening in the global industry compared to the Australian industry for some sectors. Sometimes it's the same, but sometimes it's not. You think about something like the political forces and government regulation, that can change. Now, there's a video in the in our learning management system, right? In module two, it'll be the, the first unit. Have a look at that video, which will help you understand how it can be a little bit different depending on how you define the industry. Huh. Right. We're talking about an industry value chain here, not an organizational one. All right, Icebreaker, one of my favorite brands in terms of outdoor clothing um, and hiking gear. So Icebreaker started out designing and making high quality hiking clothes from their merino wool, right? And that sell to over 50 countries worldwide. Shortly after they started, they made a decision, a strategic decision to work more directly with graziers, the people that breed and raise uh, sheep and merino, the, the high quality wool. Um, on that particular breed of sheep, right? Rather than going to basically an auction house where everyone bids and, and buys it, okay? That's what's occurring there. So in this quiz, which of the following has Icebreaker done in relation to their operational strategy, all right? Pause it now and choose one of those five options. All right, they've done backwards integration. They've gone up the value chain. So I hope that's clear for everybody. They haven't, it's not about buyer power. They definitely haven't done forwards integration. We're not talking about growth. That that little four lines was just simply about they're working directly with Merino graziers. That is their raw materials in a sense. They're going up the value chain. And when we think about value chains, it's, it's quite easy to do. Just sketch it out. Sketch out the steps, all right? Identify the parts in the chain the organization operates in because you can operate in different areas. You can operate in uh, manufacturing and in a sense customer service, but you don't do distribution and you don't you don't look after the raw materials. So often companies will will operate in parts, chain segments that are next to each other, sure, but it doesn't have to actually be that way. Okay. Think then about whether the organization could do forwards integration or backwards integration. And in a sense, you also have to think about the organizations either side of it in the value chain, whether they can do forwards integration or backwards integration and in a sense, cut out, cut out this segment, which is of course is a big threat. And in terms of being able to do this, you have to think about skills and capabilities, right? So don't always assume that an organization will want to go and suddenly become the raw material supplier and do backwards integration. The manufacturer wants to get the raw materials. It's probably not in their interest at all. In the same way, does a designer who wants to look after marketing and sell a great product, do they really want to spend millions of dollars setting up a manufacturing facility to make the product? Many people don't have any interest in doing that and that's fine. So you can go one direction for backwards integration, you're going upstream. And of course, forwards in integration, you're going downstream. And this is just an example of someone that's sitting in the design part of this industry value chain. But same thing applies if you're in distribution or production or anywhere else. Now, every industry has a life cycle, pretty much has a beginning, sometimes an end for some industries. Um, Potentially, the newspaper industry might have an end in the in the next 20 years, um, and others go through sort of a stage of renewal, right? And this is relating to the second learning objective in Module 2. Now, let's go to our pre-work and use it in application so we can quickly understand what the industry life cycle is and how it applies. So I asked you to think about, um, after looking at the complementary medicines industry survey, what stage of the industry life cycle are they in? Right, and think of a couple of reasons to support your answer. And the second part was, of course, about pestle. So it's not too hard to do. You only need to do a skim read of this document 
um, that's in the LMS and the weekly webinars unit to, to be able to make the decision. And the key points are actually, yeah, they're brought right out there for you. So it's 3.5 billion, yeah, but what's important is it's expected to grow to 4.6 billion in 2017-18. And this survey uh, is, as you know, is from 2014. 83% of these companies are expecting to grow their businesses. All right, we're gonna have an increase to 45,000 jobs um, as 58% of companies are expected to have growth in employee numbers. Right? There's three key facts hitting us right there. 23% of companies surveyed had job vacancies. 72% of manufacturers expect to see growth in employee numbers. Okay, And the manufacturers may be operating in just their segment in the chain and elsewhere, but different segments still seem to be showing through this survey that there is growth. So they are in the growth phase. All right, The supporting facts are, are nice... They're easy to find. They're nice and clear, and they're and they're in the case. And what do we mean by this this life cycle in terms of the industry? That's pretty much what the curve looks like. You know, some some industries uh, might go into more rapid decline. Others, yeah, they could be in shakeout, and they could go along a bit like this before they then dip. And some, yes, don't really even go into renewal. They actually just they don't make it out the other side. All right. But if we just think about here the growth stage, what we know about growth is that there needs to be high cash input. It means that the industry has got space for new players, but to get in, you've got to spend money, all right? Industry rivalry is generally low, and people sometimes get a bit mixed up here. They think growth, everyone's coming in, it's very, very competitive. Not really. That is much more likely to happen in the maturity stage. In the growth stage, uh, there is room um, for, for new players to come in, but they have to spend money, right? Demand should exceed supply. There should be more people wanting the product than there are people able to supply the product. Hence, you've got growth in the industry. And there's normally not that many substitute products, okay? People are either coming in with competing products before others later on are considering, or uh, perhaps customers are considering later on in the maturity of the shakeout phase, actually, do I need this product? Can I actually use something else? Okay. So it, you often find in the growth stage that individual companies' profitability levels are not that high because they're trying to grow. So they're, if you look at their cash flow statements, right, there is a lot of cash going out the door. Now, again, there's a, a knowledge clip. There's a short video on this in the LMS um, that will explain each of the different stages of the industry life cycle. In section two of module two, we're talking about both a remote environment analysis and an industry environment analysis, and they are different things. But let's start with the remote one and this idea of PESTLE. This relates to uh, a couple of different learning objectives here. We're looking at three, historical performance, growth, profitability, but we're also looking at four and five, factors affecting growth. And, and really that should have the word future in there because yes, you can look at the past, but of course, what we care about in the analysis of an industry and what strategic options they might take, we care about what's going to happen in the future for this industry and the organisations in it. Let's jump back into our 2014 survey about complementary medicines. All right. Um, which three pestle factors do you think we can make the most comments on? And I actually I purposely pick something that doesn't have everything about pestle and don't expect then in the cases you, you get in the exam, that they're going to cover off political, economic, social, that they're going to have something on the environment, the legal, the tech. It's not likely, all right? In a lot of industries, if you do enough research and you find enough reliable data, you can, you can do that. But you've got an exam to pass and you'll probably find that there'll only be two or three clear ones. And the points will be very clear, okay? But look, let's just go through some suggested answers here. You should have worked through uh, the sheet that was in the LMS, right? It's important that you've done that first. There's no point in just looking at my answers. You need to have worked through it and see how they match up, right? And there's no exact right or wrong here, but these are the sorts of things that I pulled out. So political, I saw it as a positive. A couple of things that were in the, the case, in the information. There's free trade agreements going on with Japan and Korea. There's also a, a mention about China as well. And so this will probably open up export markets, right? Opening up export markets is most likely um, going to assist in growth, okay? But it also says, well, trade policies, 
they're different in different countries. And just because we might get a free trade agreement with Japan or Korea, that doesn't mean other countries that exporters sell to don't have, um, I guess, uh, negative policies in terms of the ability to export. Things like tariffs, right? Things like regulatory burden, uh, burden in those countries can be quite difficult. An example in complementary medicines is, I believe, in the United States, the requirements for FDA, so to, to pass their pharmaceutical uh, regulations is very, very high. Most people believe it's higher than the TGA ones in Australia. And that could also be the same in other European countries, right? So that's something that isn't necessarily beneficial. So you'll get positives and neutrals and negatives, but you still should make an overall uh, decision on your analysis. The government here does appear committed to reducing regulatory burden. Fantastic. If we reduce that, that allows more players to be profitable and it probably allows some new entrants to come into the market. So overall, I reckon it's reasonably positive. Economic, not as much information really on the, on the economic. The things that I could draw out, lingering effects of the GSC says that, and I'm making here a conclusion on that, there's probably lower levels of disposable income, but I would not say that this is a, a positive plus plus, all right? It's, it's a, a weaker link. Manufacturing is performing strongly though in the sector. And it, it kind of writes it that it's a bit surprising because manufacturing overall in Australia is not doing that well, but we're talking about everything from vehicles, we know is not doing very well, through to this idea of uh, a more focused market of complementary medicines. Remember, we'd be defining the industry as that, not all medicine. That'd be a different sort of analysis. Job vacancies, expected growth. So, you know, the economy's economic factors overall aren't too bad. What about social? All right, there's clear information in there about the social impact. That's what the survey's trying to get at in a sense. <coughs> there's a growth of health, health consciousness, right? And a focus on preventative measures to reduce risks into the future. And this idea of using complementary medicines, right? Medicines that, that aren't the standard prescribed stuff from far, big pharma companies is potentially a way to go. They've got an aging population in Australia and an increase in chronic disease, all right? So a quarter of people are now using these types of medicines. Um, they're using them to supplement nutritional deficiencies. So it's likely to be an ongoing thing that they want to do. Yes, probably diet should get better, but uh, it, it seems like there's a social trend there. And it even makes makes a, a point about, you know, uh, sports enthusiasts and their love for protein drinks. Unfortunately, not for my previous business of pod, but they they still do love protein milks. They just didn't love protein water quite enough. I didn't find much on tech or environment, and that's okay. I just, I didn't find anything significant enough. And in terms of legal, now that one, that is not a positive, that is a negative, because what they're saying there is that regulatory compliance um, driven by our version of the America's FDA, which is the TGA, is making it harder uh, for companies to, to make good margins. That's basically what, what the information is saying. And also that, that new product development and the process for getting new products out there is long, it's bureaucratic, it's expensive, and it will hurt the smaller and medium enterprises more than large companies. Large pharmaceutical companies, I guess, have um, more resource, better processes to get through all these barriers and these hoops that they have to jump. Uh, and the small guys can find it, you know, really hits their cash flow. All right, so that that's the pestle. It's good to, uh, I'm hoping that you feel like it wasn't that hard, that, that you didn't have to stare at that uh, case that I gave you. Yeah, you didn't have to stare at it for an hour. You could draw that information, really you could draw it out, 10 minutes of reading, say another five, 10 minutes of checking and drawing out the key points um, and you're done. Now let's finish up here with a quiz um, on Pestle. So which of the following about Pestle is most likely correct? Pause and have a go. All right, social changes can often then influence technology changes. Now, if you weren't too sure about that one, you could still do this through process of elimination, right? Political and legal factors generally do not have a linked relationship. Well, they do. Governments write policy, set guidelines, put legislation through parliament, 
those things turn into law, legal implications. Those two are always going to be uh, closely linked, right? Changes in a GDP, a country's GDP are too broad to have an effect on individual on an individual industry. Well, no, no, there. The economic impact of the remote environment is broad. So changes in the wealth and the growth of industry um, across industries in a country does have a direct impact. All right. And saying that one particular part of PESTEL has the weakest impact in every analysis, no, that's not correct either. Okay. Social changes, and we're seeing it now with tech, tech enabling. Uh, more often the social change and maybe the tech part coming first uh, is something that's really affecting a lot of industries right now. So please don't forget it's about future growth. I know that there's a leading objective for historical growth, but I, I can guarantee you when you're thinking about a case and analysis, as much as you can look into the past, a strategic option that the organisation hasn't implemented yet, that's about, that's about the future. And you can see that there's a bit of a, a map here. In the same way we had an overall subject map, what I'm trying to do is show you that the logical steps are you choose your industry, you understand where it is in the life cycle. If, you, if you're in an industry and you all accept that you are in shakeout or decline, you are going to be thinking about different strategic options than if you're in growth. It is just a given. You're thinking about the broad review, that's this idea of PESTEL. Right? Then we want to go to a more narrow view and understand this idea of profitability. And so we're having a look next at five forces. The second part of section two is about the industry environment analysis. Right, So we're leaving the remote side. We're looking more focused at the industry. And that's what's related to Porter's five forces. We are, again, really in the same learning objectives. It does, Five Forces helps us look at historical profitability within an industry, and it also helps us look at the current and the future likely profitability levels in an industry. There's different ways you can draw it out. I quite like the visual way, and that is using the boxes, all right? Um, so that I sort of, I use the boxes and then I come into a point to go, all right, this is where I want to end up. This, this at the end is important kind of the conclusion and the summary, how competitive is it? How hard am I going to, to have to negotiate with suppliers? How easy is it for my buyers to switch? Is that going to be okay or that they could really hurt me? Are there substitute products that can fundamentally you know, change the game of this industry? Are there lots of people coming in or have the way I've got in with my IP or my big investment is actually meant that there's high barriers to entry and so I'm a little bit safer? And again, as I always like to do, apply it to a case. So the pre-work for this webinar is to read that escape route case. Yes, it's a longer case than what you're going to get in the CPA exam, but it's really, really useful to do. By doing this one longer case, in a sense, we don't have to do five, seven, nine shorter cases. We get to cover a heap of concepts in the, in the one. All right, and I asked you uh, three three questions. The first one, very easy to answer because you've already looked at that in the industry life cycle. And then I want you to really think about a five forces analysis. And I want you to draw information and insights um, out of that case. And with that, we'll also consider this idea of uh, integration because it sort of has to come up, doesn't it, as you do the analysis. So they're in the mature stage. We know that that means more rivalry. And in this case, this case is pretty much intense rivalry between the companies. We know in the mature stage that margins erode, they become smaller, right? So you do think about uh, how to cut costs, how to be more efficient, because the, the people are already been in this industry, they've been in this game in terms of how they sell products. There's not that much new product development but perhaps occurring. Um, and so it comes down to running a really tight ship, all right? See if you can get more market share off your competitors. Can you buy them out? Now, in terms of the, the five forces, here is some examples of information that I took out of the case um, in terms of starting with the threat of new entrants. And look, we can start with any force. I picked this one. I generally wouldn't start with industry rivalry. I like to let that become the conclusion. So the threat of new agencies with physical stores is low. Of course it is. It costs money and the case is telling us that Escape Route are not doing that well, right? They're, they're struggling and they're trying to grow their new online product, aren't they? 
Um, the overall industry growth is low, but online growth is high. So we're seeing already, okay, do we call them separate markets? You now, now you can, we can think of the industry as, as an online market and a face-to-face -face market, that's okay to do. Or we can just think of it in a sense, almost as two types of products. I go into the store or I go onto Webjet and buy the, the air ticket and the hotel booking online. It doesn't require though online high capital. It does require a bit of money if you wanna have a store in a large shopping center where they charge very high leases. Uh, but to get online, not that much. It's about you know getting your getting your relationships right. And there's even a bit of information about Google. They bought a large software company uh, using meta searches to offer cheaper prices. And that's that idea of that Trivago type thing, an aggregator online product, which is just getting all the price from everywhere else and trying to give the customer the best deal. But of course, margins erode. Okay, so the threat of new entrants overall is high because this case talks about stores and online. It's not it's not making them separate industries. It's the travel industry and their two ways, their two channels that you can get the product to your customers in a sense. Uh, power of supplies. All right. So main two in this case, airlines and hotels, right? They're pushing to sell directly to, to consumers. Why would they do that? Answers our last question, doesn't it? They're, they're doing a bit of integration. They're saving money. They're cutting out the middleman. That's what they're trying to do, right? There's more sophistication with uh, websites. There is big data has come into play. Uh, machine learning is coming into play in order to try to send you and I very personalised, tailored, different types of products depending on which link we clicked on inside a website that might have, you know, uh, 2,000 individual pages and individual products and where we go what would be offered and pushed on to us and in apps and everything else. Um, there's increased competition from online agencies, right? And what that has meant that there's product discounting and there's cheaper options for suppliers, okay? So what do we think the supplier power is gonna be? It's it's perhaps been medium in the past when Escape Route, Escape Route first got into the game, but it's increasing, if not already high. Buyers, wow, well, buyers have more options. What does that mean? Switching costs, lower. Easy for me to go from uh, escape route to an online webjet type thing, really easy. Um, they're not that brand loyal, ouch. Only 10% survey respondents said they would book through the same travel agency, right? 65% said, yeah, price is pretty important. But one glimmer of light, and this is what you see in a real case, because uh, Escape Route is based pretty much on, on Flight Centre. Uh, one glimmer of light, what about complex trips? What about when I want to stop in Dubai and then actually want to stop and see a friend in Amman in Jordan on the way to Germany, all right? Well, that's a bit different. And then I want to have a hotel set up and I actually want to hire a car there and, oh, it's suddenly a complex trip. Am I more likely to perhaps to use an Escape Route type service, a more personalised service? Maybe. But again, overall, switching costs are low, power of buyers is high. Power of substitutes. And this is an interesting one. Can I substitute this particular service that I'm receiving? Going into the store, meeting with uh, Derek or Susan, sitting at the desk and booking this particular flight that I want, maybe even just to get to Perth and back, all right? Well, there is, there is in a sense a substitute and it's cutting us out. The substitute is I just go to the airline and you can do that now. I just book with Virgin. How many of you now do go through Webjet and how many of you actually also just go on to, to Tiger for a cheap flight or you, you go to Qantas and, and book your business flights directly in there? Many companies now don't even use a corporate travel agency. They train their employees. You have certain parameters where you're, you're not, you know, you can fly business class for these long trips, but for the short ones, everyone's flying cattle class down the back and off you go. They just say, we're with Virgin, you go and book it with Virgin. You don't even have to go through a, a web chat. So that is in a sense is a substitute way of me, the customer getting what I, what I want, okay? So it's medium, they still have a role to play at the moment, but this, this threat really is rising. So what does it mean? We get to the end and we go, okay, we've got these, uh, these four things, 
what about this fifth thing, which is the the industry rivalry in the middle? So it's a consolidated industry. It's a mature industry. All right. There's lots more options coming onto the table. Therefore, margins are going to have to be lower. There's new entrants, not in the store space, but in the online space. And there's also this threat of a substitute service, which is I just go to the airline direct. Okay. So there's only one option for this, that the intensity of rivalry is going to be high. It's good to have a summary. When you're doing a five forces and you're, you're unlikely going to, in the written section, have to do the summary, you may be asked about just commenting on two particular forces. You may be asked to comment on the whole lot, but you'll read this case and go, well, there's only two forces to talk about. You only talk about the information that's in the case relevant to that force. Don't start going outside a case just because you know that industry or you know that organisation. You stick to, to what's in front of you on the screen. All right, we'll talk about that more when um, I get to later recordings about uh, what the exam format is and how it looks. Has integration occurred? Well, you know, we've kind of already answered this. There is integration. They're attempting to do forwards integration, right? And there's no way that a, uh, a travel agent in an escape route uh, is going to be doing backwards integration. They're not going to start an airline company or a chain of hotels. It's just not going to happen. All right, what can they do? Not much. They're, they are a bit stuck. And we know what they're going to attempt to do, you know, rebirth their uh, past sort of failed online product, their, their, their online site. All right, which of the following is a substitute rather than a competitor out of those three? All of them. Remember, we talked about industry definition. Depending on how you define it will influence whether it's a substitute or a competitor. If it's the pharmaceutical industry, then they really are competitors. They're together now. Perhaps in the past, it could have been seen as a substitute, but it's much more now that medicine, uh, generic medicine is, is a big volume and big money game now, and they're competing with um, the patented products, all right? Pork in relation to chicken. If it's a red meat industry, which is a, a definition by IBIS and by um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, then chicken's a substitute. It's actually part of the white meat industry. Bus in relation to train. If it's a metropolitan transport industry, then they're competitors, right? If there is, I mean, it's not really a train industry, that they're more likely to be competitors, but... If it is um, a metro, in some countries you have different services operating different underground metros. So they're competing all against each other in the metro. A substitute product is above ground, taking the bus, walking, getting in a cab. All right, and there are videos that you can watch on this using example to and going using the same example through each one to help you embed it. What will be the impact on the threat of new entrants if the industry is extremely profitable, all right? Is it a greater threat, a lower threat, or it's going to be neutral? The industry is profitable. What's the threat of new entrants? All right, so generally, if it's profitable, people want to get in. Now, I can say with a caveat here, for sure, um, if there's a huge amount of capital to spend, then it is hard to get in, even though it is profitable, right? But in most cases, an industry that is generating decent profits, whether it's sort of in growth or maturity, is a good thing for other companies to get in. You're going to have people that think, I can make a buck out of this, all right? All right. So why are these issues questions relevant in terms of the threat of new entrants? Distribution requirements, there's my old protein water. You know, why is that hard? Well, you've got a product. If you don't have uh, assets to distribute it yourself, you've got to use somebody else and you've got to get it into certain stores. When you're competing with large 
competitors who don't always play by the book, that's not easy. That can be a real barrier to entry. We're thinking about threats. We're thinking about um, barriers to entry. Proprietary products or tech. All right, this gentleman here was a not very popular person who bought the proprietary rights to a, um, a drug that I think was used, I think it was used to treat um, people with HIV, right, and then jacked the price up. Jack the price up through the roof um, to make a lot of money, but got everybody very, very upset. But he had bought the proprietary rights to that. All right, so have a look at that clip in terms of um, new entrants. What's the impact on supplier power if there is a high concentration of suppliers? All right, they'll have more power. And it's just important to make this point now because I know it can be confusing. Uh, a high concentration means fewer organisations, right? And I completely understand why it is confusing to some people. They think a high concentration of um, salt, salty water means more salt, more salt granules in the same one litre of water. But in this case, high concentration just means there's fewer. Just, you just got to remember that. So there's fewer suppliers, right? They are likely, they will have more power. What other things can we consider when we're thinking about the power of suppliers? Okay. Concentration, yes. The proportion of the supplier's cost to the total buyer's cost, right? The profitability of the supplier. Facebook and Google are very profitable companies. Right? They are doing well. It makes them powerful, as well as having sort of sort of proprietary or just massive brand strength as well as concentration there's not that many of these platforms in terms of advertising if we're thinking about the advertising part of their business all right they're not that many big big players that have a huge amount of reach that companies want to go to okay the proportion of the supplier's cost to the total uh the total buyer's cost it's actually small this is millions and millions um of buyers. Now, what about uh, the ability to backwards integrate? Okay, this one, um, it, it depends. You're not going to do it if you don't have the skills readily available or you can't get those skills in. It's already a strategic stretch type uh, strategy and that it requires a fair bit of capital. You're unlikely to do it. Could I have with Pod distributed my drinks? Well, yeah, I did at the start. And then I used a third party distributor because I had to get out there quicker. But, and, and after that, I could have brought it back and then just done the distribution myself. Now, that's forwards integration for me, right? Is the distributor likely to do backwards integration and make the product? No, it's, it's not their game. It's not, not their type of business and it's going to cost much more money. Okay. What's the ability of, um, buyers to switch between suppliers. So if supplier A and supplier B are pretty much giving me the same widgets. They're giving me the same bolts for my business that makes machinery. Unless one is a standout quality over the other, it's all about price, isn't it? Brand strength, ah, that tries to move it the other way. That's why I've got the photo there, photo there of Apple. You build amazing brand strength, right? And then as a supplier, in the sense of Apple to us as buyers, all right, brand strength means my switching costs are higher. It's the cost of having the Apple product and being in the Apple ecosystem or, in a sense, going to Android, going somewhere else. Okay, so again, we can have a look at the video. The impact on buyer power if the buyer is very profitable. Okay, now this one, this one comes up a bit with students sometimes, a little bit confused about this. But if the buyer... It's most likely if the buyer is profitable, okay, they've got, they've got a lot of money, they can hunt around. If they're profitable, they're probably selling a lot more units. If we think about supermarkets as an example, they are quite profitable, they buy an enormous amount, they drive harder negotiations, they just can. All right, their power is then increased over a little protein water supply like myself trying to get into a supermarket. Do you think I can walk in there, sit down, with what they call them buyers and just say, well, I want 
$2.85 per unit and that's it and I'm not budging. It doesn't work like that. And one of the key reasons is they're much more profitable than me, much larger volumes, but great chance for me to get in, but I'm going to have to accept lower margins. Okay. So again, types of things that are um, you need to consider. Concentration again of buyers. Are there a lot of buyers? High concentration, small amount of buyers. All right, the portion of the items cost to the total buyer's cost, but also the importance of the item to the buyer. I'm just highlighting three there, but there's all these other ones you can consider. Don't look for every single one in the case. You don't have to tick them all off in order to go, I've met the condition that power of buyers is high. It's not, it's not like that. But they're all things that you can think about when you're reading, uh, when you're reading through a case. All right, access to information, that's an important one. That's about whether the intellectual property is of the product is, is high or whether as the buyer, I can get the information about the product. And once I've got information, it's not that I'm going to necessarily build my own, but I can start to more easily look at other competitor products. That's why product review websites exist. That's why they're so powerful. Because I go on and I go, well, this is a bit of tech. What is the difference between... Uh, this particular washing machine and that one. And I look at reviews about even technical aspects of it to then go, oh, okay. And then I concentrate myself more on that particular brand, but maybe a couple of different models of that washing machine. And I start looking at more online buying sites. And you can just see for the industry, margins are reducing and reducing and reducing. And it's, it's, it's just always going to be challenging for them. So they want to shift a lot of volume. All right. And just to finish off here, I just want to finish off with something. You need to make conclusions, just like Pestle, about industry profitability. Please don't sit on the fence, whether it's the CPA exam or whether it's when you're out in your corporate strategy team and you're looking at this stuff. Uh, you, you need to still be making a recommendation to your CEO and, and your board because it might be along the lines of, we want to acquire another company in a particular industry. And this is why we think there is there is growth, there is the ability to be profitable. It can be seen as a combination as well. If we go to the, the financial accounting part um, of it, you can also mix all of this qualitative information with quantitative stats there, the number of supplies, how profitable they are, what sort of substitute products exist, uh, with this idea of CAPM, the risk-free rate, inflation, the, the idea of industry risk, okay? So you you don't have to do it in GSL, but just be aware that's what you're bringing it back to. And the reason I say that is when you think about the profitability of a, profitability of a company, you've got to benchmark it. So 15% ROE is great in ag, right? But it's not great in, in communications, in telecommunications. So just remember when you, you're doing this and you're asked to go away and crunch some numbers and come back, looking at particular industries or sub-segments even, think about the benchmarking of things like um, return on assets, return on equity, uh, return on capital employed, on Rochi. Think about those benchmarks so that you're actually providing, you know, the, the clear uh, analysis to uh, to the people that need to read it. And that's, uh, that's the end, really, of section two. Um, and now we're into section three. So in section three of module two, we're looking at markets, industries and markets, and thinking also about customers and customer segmentation. And this relates to the learning objective of number six about base of competition and success factors. And I know it's not written uh, specifically in that, but th this idea of markets and customers comes under learning about the basis of competition. It's, it's one of the factors in how you form your opinion on that. So this is a bit of a short section. So um, markets and industries, and uh, just to, to try and make this a bit simpler, because again, um, students will sometimes feel like there's a level of confusion as to which is which and how many markets uh, does the market, you know, can it be a customer market, can it be a product market? And the answer is yes, it, yes, it can. Just think of it, a market as a group of customers, the, the people that are buying the products or using the services, right? That's that's your market which sits inside a broader industry. A simple example, industry market one, two, and three, right? You should be able to tell me the industry pretty easily. We have the SUV, right? We have the, 
the small hatchback and we have the 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 light uh light truck so a tray truck there okay they are different markets why are they different markets well they're pretty much different customers aren't they the suv customer to the small hatchback customer to the person that needs a trade truck potentially for their business not likely one to drop off the kids at school all right so your industry well what is it pretty clear you know, we're in the automotive industry but we have different markets for them they do not treat these products that they've built the same way because they're selling them to different people. Sometimes they're using different channels to get them to those customers. So they see them as different markets. Here's a quiz. Which of the following is correct about analyzing customer markets? All right, there's four options there. Have a go at that one. All right, the answer here is one of the difficulties in defining customer segments is getting enough information about it. All right. It's often easier to get broad macro information um, about things to do with pestle, things to do with five forces, than it sometimes is to get that much more finer detail around customers, their behaviour their purchasing patterns. Now, things are changing with, with big data. If you think about before this idea of just reams and reams of data, tetrabytes of data coming through from um, scanning machines in supermarkets and, and the way that we just use a credit card to tap on everything, sure, stuff has changed. But you still want to have a lot of unstructured data. You want to be able to understand product reviews, right? It's not just about whether it was one star or five. It's about what people write. And so getting that data, especially with unstructured data, is it, it can be quite challenging. All right, Blue Ocean's about using innovation to leverage latent demand. Right? It's not about customer markets at all. Uh, customers in terms of stakeholder influence, if, look, it's not, not one of the categories that the study guide's setting out, so we ignore that one. And uh, based on product usage levels, again, this, this is one people will sometimes slip up on. That is not psychographic. That is behaviour. That is my purchasing behaviour, not the psychographic segment. So, look, there's a, there's a video on this which I think is pretty self-explanatory. Again, using an example, this is a short video. It's in our LMS. But you have basically got uh, demographic, psychographic, behavioural, distribution and geographic. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. They are the suggested ways the study guide says that you can break down your customers into segments. And it's really important for me as a marketer, That's this is something I'm always looking at uh, in terms of how I think about my customer group, even CPA students, in breaking them down in terms of perhaps study behaviour, but also what they want, where they want to go in their career, um, where do they live. Uh, I don't you know, I don't need to know all of your ages and your incomes, but I need to have some rough idea of uh, the types of dem the demographic types of a customer base, whether it's for knowledge equity or whether it was for pod protein water. You can see it for, for any other um, industry and organisation as well. So have a look at that uh, video. Uh, I think it's uh, self-explanatory. And of course, you know, you can email us at uh, gsl at knowledgeequity.com.au if you have any questions. All right, that is uh, the end of sections one, two, and three in module two for global strategy and leadership.